All right, so I want to thank. Uh, oh, <laughs> there you go, walleye fan. Ah, now is it quiet? Uh. As we begin the workshop, and I do want to give again a thank you for those who uh, who pop capsules, and to uh, Daily for for picking up that uh, that that heck and chonker of a tank. My gosh, uh, that infernal war machine is something else. I want to go over, I want to go over a couple prompts, things to help remind us of what we're going to be looking for when we're when we're doing our dungeon polish. Because all through the week, I mean, I have I have documents. We have our settlement document. I have the NPC document. I have our villain document. And then, of course, there is the prompt here, our dungeon concept. But before we go and fill this out and we start either drawing, because we, draw, we drew a very basic example of our dungeon last night uh, before I went over to D&D time, and about how the different rooms would hold elements that are going to tell the, the story of the main villain. You know, before we worry about that, and of course this is, uh, we also made another map, which was the city itself and the region in which it lies. If kobolds were real, I wonder what life would be like. Um, it would be, well, because kobolds are about the same size as toddlers, so if you've ever seen that, uh, what that movie, uh, is it Bad Baby or something? No, that, that's Bad Santa. The, the one where the, it's like Baby's Inc. No, that's Monsters Inc. Whatever. It has, uh, Alec Baldwin as the voice of the main uh, boss baby. I think that's the one. Uh, if kobolds existed, it'd be boss baby. Um, <laughs> Or, um, or as Frogman said, imagine dogs with hands. It would be, uh, it'd be something, it, it wouldn't even be Madagascar, because it'd be, what's the one with pets? Uh, animals, like, what animals do when we don't look, or something like that? It'd be that movie. You'd have a, bu a bunch of, uh, you know, a bunch of different short stacks getting into trouble, uh, fooling, uh, fooling around with each other, and the secret life of pets, that's right, Cold Spark. If kobolds existed, it would be the secret life of pets. <laughs> now, the first prompt or the, the first concept that I wanted to put forward for us to consider and discuss, and we can even do some brainstorming because right now we don't have digital pen to digital paper just yet. I can name pretty much any movie title, even if I haven't seen it. That is Osheep's superpower. Now, the first concept I want to explore with you all is that of the five-room dungeon. Now, it doesn't have to mean that every dungeon has only five rooms. This is a way to compartmentalize aspects of a dungeon to make sure that there's uh, an experience to be had along the way. Um, have you seen the one with dinosaurs in the rain? Say, so, oh, 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 sheeps, you might be tested now. Take a look at the Tomb of Annihilation. Now, of course, there's a lot of there's a lot of dungeons, uh, not just you know the main one that is the you know the name well kind of the namesake. I'm not going to spoil anything, but uh, there's more than five rooms. I'll, I'll give you a hint in in the the final big dungeon. However, there are many things that could be considered a dungeon before there uh, before that time, and some of them are only one room or three rooms. That still doesn't mean that we can't incorporate the concept. You know, what are the milestones to the dungeon? The first concept is that there's an entrance with a guardian. Right? There has to be a reason why nobody else has come here before. It's difficult to get to. It's hidden. There's a guard posted outside or a foreign big nasty decided the entrance makes for a good lair. Something only heroic types could overcome. An antagonist right away gets the player's excitement up and gets the dice rolling. 
So the entrance could be trapped. There's multiple entrances, uh, but only one is correct. Uh, the entrance requires a special key or a ceremony. Uh, so think the speak friend and enter. Um, and that's from, uh, that's from The Hobbit. A guardian was deliberately placed at the entrance. A golem, like a stone golem. Hey, Daily. Uh, a golem, a guard dog, uh, a nightclub bouncer. You know, it, uh, the concept of a bouncer could still be, you know, get ye flask medieval times D&D. &D. Uh, but this five-room dungeon can apply to... Mo to uh, You want to build a dungeon, quote-unquote, for your vampires in Vampire the Masquerade? You know, they're going to go on a sewer crawl. They're going to go through a warehouse. Uh, they're going to try and infiltrate a corporate building to sneak some information out of a, fi a locked file cabinet on the top floor. That's a dungeon. Um, and not in literal terms where it's, you know, like in a kind of a stone basement where people would, were jailed or tortured. Uh, but it's this instance of, you know, micromanaging time and effects. Um, a hidden ambush waits in the shadows or a portcullis that the kobold guards can pass through easily, but the heroes must expose themselves to lift. So it's an advantage to the natives. And this is something that the kobolds would do. Like, we know we're short. We get it. And we're not going to have a hard time passing through a portcullis that uh, you big old, you know, you big giants out there, uh, you know, you fatty humans and elves, uh, you'd have to, you know, really squeeze or get pinned or something along those lines, and that would give away any intruders. Now, another room beyond this, a puzzle or a role-playing challenge, or both, as two separate instances or as one. For uh, those whose characters aren't the fighting types, the next area lets them show off the skill points they spent in diplomacy or spot checks. This pleases the players who didn't pick rangers and barbarians and breaks up the pace a bit before getting back to the roar. Be sure to allow for multiple solutions, because playing the guess what I'm thinking game is boring for players. Once you figure out the puzzle here, go back to room one and put some uh, and put some clues. Now I'm gonna put this up here as a as a link for you all if you want to check this out for yourself. So this is a chessboard floor with special squares, a hallway of colored portals with an old riddle telling them which way to go. A corrupt city official can give them permits to enter the radiation sector. And and that's the challenge, right? How do you uh, how do you get uh, permission to go to this this guarded this off limits sector officially even or w or with permission? Well, you, so you find someone who's corrupt but will gr at least grant the authority to be there if you get caught. The apartment building has buzzers for tenants, but the quarry is using an assumed name. Ah. The chamber of the Ark is covered in venomous snakes that will shy away from open fire. Hey, there you go. Uh, oh, sheeps. The chamber of the Ark is covered in venomous snakes that will shy away from open fire. There's a, a, a test for you. Or the floor is covered in pressure plates for dart traps that kobolds are light enough to ignore. Again, we have this dungeon, this kobold dungeon, where they can easily go in and out of the front door, and they can walk with confidence because they're all too light to trigger any of the traps they have set up uh, for those, you know, for the, the dwarf, which is just obviously going to uh, set off the poison darts or whatever. Which one, though, oh sheeps? You can't just say that because there's four. Some of you may wish that there's three, and and the fourth one to drop off is usually a swing between Crystal Skull, or uh, or Temple of Doom, and I, I get that. Yeah, all right. Oh, sheeps, you got it. Salty Dragon Tavern. Uh, good afternoon to you. Where it is two seventeen p.m. Sunday. Ah. 
But welcome. Uh, we're doing some review for the steps to uh, to not just build a dungeon, but to really put some polish on it. And uh, of course, you know, you uh, we're we're going to be raiding you later here, so I don't know if you have any tricks up your sleeve. But you and any other DM are welcome to share some, uh, you know, some concepts of your own, or if you've done the five room dungeon concept or these others that we're going to be reviewing. Now, included as well is some kind of a trick or a setback. This is where you raise the stakes. Something about the plan has gone wrong, because of course, what is a plan but a list of things that can go wrong? Something the opposite of what they expected. Maybe the NPC they brought along gets kidnapped. Maybe they fight the big bad, but it's actually a minion pretending. This room is good for giving your players a second dose of fighting or puzzle, whichever they prefer. This is also a good opportunity to get players to waste some resources that could be useful in the big fight in room four, such as using up their flaming oil on a troll when a mummy is the big bad evil guy. Uh, they're in discovery and panic mode while in the Black City, so no major dungeons happening for a while. Well, it's, so it still sounds like, though, you have them... They're, they may not be in a dungeon, but it sounds like they are in this, in a contained environment uh, that they're having to watch their resources. Uh, which isn't just spell slots, it is also, you know, if you say that they're in, in a panic mode, they have social capital, they have, um, you know, they, they have their own wits, which could be coming to an end at, at some point. But you're welcome to talk about what they do, they do very much. Uh, so you're welcome to talk about the, their circumstances and, and, you know, how you are addressing it. Um, you know, unless you think it's spoiling anything in case one of your players sees this, but... Um, if you want to share anything, and for those out there, again, who are watching, you're welcome to as well. So the hostages they rescued demand or plead to be taken back immediately before the, he the heroes can find the villain. Right? That's the trick. So the heroes have come to save the day, and they, they actually put down the sub-boss, and they rescue, the, they rescue the, the missing villagers. And the villagers say, good, now get us out of here, please. But it's, it's two days back to the village. You have to take us back. We have to get back to our families. But we gotta go fight the boss. We could die! So, what do you do? Do you convince them or dupe them? Do you tie them back up and leave them in the room until you come back for them? Uh, what, this is now something that, that takes that initial momentum and gives them a bit of a speed bump to contemplate things. And to see, perhaps, the stakes that, uh, that are, that are there. I'm thinking about starting a game where it is all about adventuring. Do you know of a different system I can use besides D&D? Um, uh, yes, walleye fan. Have you heard of, um, uh, shoot, why am I derping on the name? Uh, well, Frogman, so even beyond that, it's, uh, it's Tension, I think it's, is what it's called. And it's, it's a role-playing system of sorts. That involve that that involves a Jenga tower, and so every time your your players do something that is at stake or at risk, um, they have to move a Jenga block, as per the dread. Thank you, Coffee Cat. Dread, and so the tower grows and the tower grows, and when the tower comes crashing down. Uh, I mean, you could have that be a character death if you want, or something something big and eventful happens at that point in time. You died in your own office in Dread. Yeah, Phydrin says Dread is good. So yeah, uh, Dread, it's very simple, very he storytelling heavy. You could use it with any system. Um, uh, Pathfinder is certainly a venerable RP system. It's based off of... Well, the first one was based off of the the three five open gaming license. Um, Pathfinder has a lot of customization. Uh, it is very kind of micromanaging your character because you can you can make very specific builds for your character. Uh, so that being said, it is more. I don't want to say role play rules heavy. But there are there's so many different variables to adjust for things and allow for things, uh, you know. So think think third edition, think three five. Um, 
and uh, and and so and, and well to an extent, Frogman, I agree because there's less bloat because Second Edition just came out. Uh, Second Edition is still you know a micromanagement game of uh, of characters, and I'm not saying that in a disrespectful manner. Heck, I carry Pathfinder 2E on my RP shelves. Um, it's it is still a role playing game. There's just a lot more to the character sheet, so it would be something to get used to. Fate, okay. Salty Dragon says their whole plot is about finding a druid death cult, something they accidentally tripped over. So last week they found a sick patient inside a hospice that had the telltale signs of the Black Plague. They experimented on some ideas and in doing so found the Black Plague was some... Uh, the Wait, found out the Black Plague was somewhat sentient, but reacted violently when they uh, sued protection from good and evil spirits. Or I, I guess that used. Hmm. Or... A sentient plague. Of course, the first thing that came to my mind in a visualization is uh, the the Venom symbiote, in a way. Uh, what is another trick or setback? You found the Lich's lair, but he seems awfully weak. And isn't he a Demi-Lich? Also, Salty Dragon brought one up. You've discovered, you've, you've discovered the source of the sickness. It's a plague. The trick or setback? Ooh. It's it's sentient. Ooh. The heroes found the data they need to steal, but it's encrypted, and the password uh, the the password is further inside. One of the NPCs that came along takes the magic dingus for himself and runs off. Ah, yes. Uh, this is a, a good generic term, it, it, not necessarily for a MacGuffin. A MacGuffin is uh, a, a MacGuffin is a specific dingus. How about that? Oh, uh, Savage Worlds might work for you also, Walleye. Uh, Savage Worlds. I think that might have been brought up above. The heroes walk right into... See, so we're talking kobolds. The heroes walk right into the uh, kobolds playing uh, a sport with swinging boulders from high ledges. And so here's the trick. They open they open the chamber and... Vroom, there is... Uh, there's uh, already just... Uh, they've either been spotted or it, as soon as the door opens, there's a boulder just waiting to go because they walked in on this game on this really weird or elaborate game that has been being played. Then we have some kind of a big climax along the way. Uh, here's the ringleader, the goblin chieftain, the big kahuna. Big O, it's showtime. Spend more of your effort on tactics, set pieces, and showy effects on the fight in this room, because this is what the adventure module is named after. So make a detailed map with interesting terrain and usable props for jumping, tripping over, grabbing, swinging, etc. Start or end with some acting. Maybe the boss needs to stall to finish preparing or to allow for reinforcements. Maybe there's a hapless minion to toy with while the leader falls. Uh, the big bad is going to have powers that are beyond the monsters and traps encountered up until now. The lair is trapped. And of course, there's lair actions in 5th edition D&D. Don't forget that either. Lair actions are things that, that that's a tool in your belt as a dungeon master. And only the BBEG knows how to get around the room safely. Uh, previous rooms might have clues for the weaknesses of the main villain. And we talked about that in our dungeon concept last night. And you're going to see that come to fruition tonight. The evil guy has the holy what's it in his grasp. Again, what's it's are, ding, are dinguses or dingai if you prefer. And, uh, and of course, a MacGuffin. Uh, a MacGuffin is uh, certainly a dingus, but it's less of a what's-it. Uh, and threatens to destroy it. Uh, or, in, or in this case, you know, think, uh, if we're thinking Indiana Jones, it's the grail. And don't, don't cross the seal, Elsa. Elsa, don't cross the seal. The kobold chief has a magic staff a pet that steals players' gear, and a rolling boulder trap that his followers can avoid by climbing ledges and using ranged attacks. Uh, 
And finally, a reward and some kind of revelation. Because killing the boss here doesn't mean that either the dungeon is done. Uh, turkeys are done, people are finished. That the, the players have finished the dungeon. Or even that they've finished the story that you're presenting. So here's where you sucker punch the players. The big fight is over. Time to pat each other on the back for another great job. Or is it? Yeah, or don't cross the streams. <laughs> We're, uh, I think we, we brought up Ghostbusters earlier, too. Um, it doesn't have to be an actual fifth room. It could be a plot twist that reveals itself after the big fight in room four. Maybe the players will find the plot hook to the next adventure or clues about a major plot arc over the campaign. Or maybe the real villain will reveal himself and twirl his mustache. <laughs> so a trap is sprung which reanimates the big guy from room four. Bonus treasure is uncovered which leads elsewhere, such as part of a treasure map or deed to some land. After being weakened by the fight in room four, the bad guy uncloaks from following the heroes and snatches the, uh, the what's it. The capture, uh, so uh, in, in that instance is um, a link to the past. Uh, in Zelda, a link to the past, there is a, a dark world dungeon uh, called Thieves Town. And the boss named Blind is an example of something along those lines. You learn that the captured princess wasn't kidnapped, gasp, but ran away from home to elope with the bad guy. And so they fought, they fought and fought, and they've solved puzzles to get here, only to find out that the princess went voluntarily, despite her parents' wishes, back at the palace. But she went voluntarily, and at least uh, according to this other person's culture or country, they are legally wed. Now, what do you do? Because you just murdered your way to the top level of the castle or or into, you know, into into the middle of Cal Drogo's camp. Ah, the true gruesome meaning behind a national holiday is discovered. Dun, dun, dun. The alien's language is deciphered, revealing that the hostilities was all just a misunderstanding. Hey, Derek, welcome. Oh, did you uh, like did did you work out too hard or something, and you're just like super sore? Hey, TJ, uh, good afternoon to you. Uh, a prophecy comes true, but not the way the players expected. Oh, the office paid for four hours of paintball. All right, so you can't move your arms, but did you have a blast? Did you get to use your 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 tactics like your D and D tactics? Like, what, did you turn this into like IRL squad based fighting? <laughs> uh, or lastly, for the reward of revelation, the kobold chief was pressured into raiding the human villages by a young white dragon who demanded tribute. So this whole time, the kobolds may may be menacing because that's just they're they're they have a foreign culture. But they didn't really want to upset the locals. They're just bullied into it by this uh, by this white dragon. Because, of course, they're going to listen to the dragon. And so, you know, you murdered your way through them and only to find out, well, no hard feelings, but it's the dragon made us do this. Otherwise, we wouldn't have. We're very sorry. You know, the Dr. Wily kind of, you know, uh, bow at the end. Oh, pain, not paint. Then wait, what's what's four hours of pain ball? Here I thought you, you like you, you got to go out for a uh, <laughs> for like a team building exercise and go out and play paintball with the other people uh, at your work. And <laughs> I mean, look, sometimes if you're playing pinball, TG, uh, TJ, uh, you you can have some pretty ruckusy pinball events that would end up leaving your arms pretty sore. Of course, that that's usually when the table says tilt. <laughs> 
Game's called uh, RoboCop. One person is RoboCop and cannot be killed. They have to give up. Everyone else is one hit kill. I guess we're learning some rules to a game here. I haven't heard of this one. Uh, so here, I mean, there's other links uh, on this site too. Uh, if you want, there are five room dungeons already made for you. And we could always use these as a prompt. You know, it says if you're feeling super lazy or we take inspiration from things that are around us. Now we already have our, our core inspiration from the dungeon that we ended up uh, doing a basic design for last night. Um, but it doesn't hurt to, to follow that link. And before we move on once more, I will post a link in chat uh, if you want to see this for yourself. It's a 15 versus 1 scenario. You were Robocop. Lasted 4 minutes, 47 seconds. It was 7 eliminations before I had to tap out. So what... Tap out from what, then? Like, what? what is the mechanic that would have the invincible Robocop tap out? Oh, okay. So it is paintball. <laughs> it's a pain endurance game. Okay. You know what, Derek? Uh, that kind of reminds me of the scene from Star Trek Next Generation where Worf... Uh, where Worf goes through... Um, oh, hey, Pouty Lips, welcome. Uh, Worf goes through his uh, his Klingon initiation since he missed it uh, due to uh, the events in his past. Yeah, the pain sticks, exactly. And so Derek is... I just imagine Derek, you know, he has the ridges, and here, you know, here's this... You know, <laughs> I mean, you're talking about Ventru uh, Fortitude, right? You know, here is like Derek, you know, just walking through, and the other Klingons are just jabbing him with the pain sticks. Ugh! And he staggers, but he takes the next step forward. Only in this case, they're, they're the paint sticks. And... <laughs> and so Derek has gone through his Klingon rite of initiation. <laughs> Is it bad I imagine Mouse and Gutter having a paintball match now since they talked about bullet tag? <laughs> oh my goodness. Ooh, that's savage. How, did... Ooh. Yeah, jeez. Well, uh... Alright, so in conclusion though, Derek, despite this, was this... Was this, like, a good bloodletting? Was this... You know, I am. I feel like a, a man of endurance and honor. Uh, you know, was this? Yes, I've done this, and I may have. I have the welts to prove it, and it stings and it hurts like a son of a, a paintball gun right now. But are you are you on that adrenaline high, or are you like, why did I do this? Ah. Your boss says you're an office legend now. Can't even imagine how many welts. <laughs> well, sounds like pictures are going to be forthcoming. <laughs> Um, so our next, our next part of our dungeon concept exploration is, uh, over here with a, a dungeon checklist on the Goblin Punch website. And this is a very handy list of things. You don't have to have all of them or even any of them, though. These are recommendations that, that come to other DMs when they're designing to consider having this in your dungeon. Uh, the first, and this is in no particular order, something to steal. Treasure gives players a reason to go into the dungeon in the first place. On a metagame level, treasure is money, money is XP. Now, of course, that depends on the system and the age of the system. Treasure is money, money is XP, and XP is tied to the idea of character advancement. It's the prime mover of the system. So two points. First, remember that treasure doesn't need to be treasure. It can be shiny stuff, such as boring old coins or the the jeweled brazier of the zombie queen. Oh, my. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Knowledge, such as where to find more treasure or information you can use to blackmail the king or even a sage who can answer a single question honestly. 
You own the Quickie Mart? Yes. Really? Yes. Really? Yes. Thank you. Come again. <laughs> oh, for any of you that get the reference, I hope that gave you a, a chuckle. I can see some kobolds ha having painted spear that was paralyzing agent that freezes the players in contact. Oh, so you, you think that uh, kobolds would uh, invent or play a game of, uh, of paintball similar to what Derek was talking about? If anything, the drow do it, except it makes you sleepy. Though I can imagine, uh, I can imagine instead they'd have little pain-causing darts instead of sleepy ones. Uh, friendship, such as an amorous purple worm that follows you around and protects you when it's hungry and a little bored. Occasionally, it leaves egg sacs laying around for you to, uh, well, do whatever. Harvest them, eat them, whatever you want. Um, or if it requires nutrients, look, we don't often talk about needing that five-minute break when you stop off to the side of the road on an, on an adventure. Uh, trade goods, like a wagon full of tea worth 10,000 gold pieces. Um, so it could just be, yeah, it's worth a lot, but it's not gold. It's not a jeweled encrusted crown. It's something that, you know, paint certain colors uh, were very rare back in Gitty Flask times. And even geographically, uh, or even depending on the area, gold might not have a lot of worth because it's very commonly used by uh, one set of people. But they absolutely want salt or a spice or something along those lines. Tiefling play paintball with Firebolt. Ah, see, I, I definitely could believe something like that, Walleye. Except it's sleepy for a long time, clarifies TJ. Oh, a Firebolt and the Hellish Rebuke spell? <laughs> gotcha! No, you didn't! I got you! <laughs> That's near five minutes and about 700 rounds. Oh. My goodness. I'll I'll take a peek at it here in a little bit. I'll have to get my courage up. <laughs> uh, something is territorial, like a tower the players can claim as their own, or an apartment in a nice part of the city. Some so something to uh, in this case. Um, oh yeah, and the chances of being stabbed in your sleep are dramatically reduced. Uh, this is a reward of sorts that's offered in the Bloodlines 1, and maybe even the Bloodlines 2, Vampire the Masquerade game, where you you end up, are, you're granted a little apartment, uh, though you end up getting something bigger and better later on, depending on your choices. See, I don't know that much about paintball, so I mean, I it, from it, how it sounds, uh, three fifty is is really high. While uh, you're saying what, it's normally around one twenty five. Like, I imagine the you know the the course owner signed off on this, uh, or just useful adventuring stuff like a magic sword, a scroll of blot out the sun, or a parachute. Uh, treasure tells a story too. Cover your treasure in religious symbols, anoint it in troll blood. Don't let your coins be coins. You know, anyone can have gold coins, but these are the coins of an ancient kingdom or something along those lines that could be a clue elsewhere. I've done this. I've used this in the Tuesday game. Oh, not feet per second. Okay. Okay. Let your coins be tiny mimics, or let your let your coins be uh, scarab beetles that uh, burrow under your flesh, uh, like the scarabs from Mummy or the paintballs in Derek's latest endeavor. <laughs> oh, that's because that's kind of what it sounded like. Uh, you might actually, Derek, as a venture, you might actually now have blue blood because of this endeavor. <laughs> this is bragging rights. Uh, something to be killed. Yeah, this is pretty obvious. Of course, there are threatening things in the dungeon. Uh, there has to be some challenge, otherwise it isn't a dungeon. Now, yes and no. 
This is, you know, this is an opinion piece, kind of a casually written one. I think we get the gist, but you can have a dungeon that ultimately doesn't have something to be killed in it. Uh, or at least not in a direct fashion. The simplest way to do that is with things that are trying to kill you. Uh, and so, yes, you can have monsterless dungeons based on traps. Those are cool, but that's why this checklist is written in pencil, not in stone. There are many ways to make combat, even with basic monsters, more interesting. And the biggest one, and I believe it was Derek, and Derek, correct me if I'm mistaken. The biggest thing that you can do to ramp up the difficulty of, a, of an encounter with CR 1 8 goblins or CR 1 half kobolds. The best way you can level them up without touching a single stat is to run them intelligently or with an intelligence that goes outside a basic description or that meta of, well, it's a dumb monster. It's just going to go up to someone and hit it until it falls over. Intelligent monsters ramp up the difficulty of your encounters without you needing to walk a fine line of is this going to mechanically slaughter my players if something goes wrong and and spe yeah specifically if they have prep time have a lot of them uh, work yeah so masses can work and TJ says uh, monsters with dynamite on their backs <laughs> that, that is also you know actually here uh, monsters with dynamite on their backs uh So there are ways to there are ways to go about this, um, you know. So there's something to be killed can go through here. Maybe the trick or the setback or something, you know, a way to soften up the characters. In fourth edition, and I carry this into fifth edition, and you've seen me use this on the Tuesday game too. I use minions. Minions were a, a wonderful, absolutely wonderful part of combat in fourth ed. I loved them, and I use them in fifth ed too. And I do it again in sixth if I had the chance. Not that I want 6th edition to drop quickly. Anyone in Wizards watching this? Just keep 5th going. It's good. Just keep it going like it is. Give it another 10 years, then we'll talk about 6th ed. Uh, I ran a dungeon for a one-shot where the kobolds carried sticks of dynamite to prove their bravery. Ah! And and of course, too. So, you're like, oh, you know, the, uh, I'm going to use Firebolt. It, because Firebolt, you know, whether, whether it's meta knowledge or not, a Firebolt can one-shot a Kobold. Watch this, everyone. Or I'm going to, I'm just going to fire, uh, I'm going to fireball the lot of them. You know, there's what, 10 Kobolds? Even if they take half damage, most of them are dead anyway. Fireball. <laughs> Skadoo. Oh. What? They blow up? Now, when did it happen? Well, you didn't pay attention. You didn't look around. You don't like them, coffee. Oh, goodness. I hope it doesn't come down to uh, you, you and me having a tussle. <laughs> Though, of course, remember this, everyone. The ultimate weapon that a bad guy can carry is poo on a stick. No one would want to fight that monster. No one will... F a kobold with poo on a stick might as well be a Tarrasque. Uh, because no one's going to want to get near it. No one's going to want to get hit by it. No one's going to want to take that chance. And, yeah, like, that is the that is the boss of, of any game that you want. Just put... Its weapon is poo on a stick. Silver Pirate says, Kobolds with intelligence? I see nothing wrong with this. There are we uh, there are uh, there are holdout diehard fans that doesn't want to run kobolds or goblins or whatever as just kind of like kind of half derpy monsters and that's fine. Uh, also, remember that dungeons tell their story through nouns. The history of a dungeon is usually relayed through monster choices. Why orcs when you can use degenerate cannibal versions of the original dwarven inhabitants? The and by the way, so probably nouns that you meant adjectives. Still, the descriptions of those creatures, a barnacle-covered zombie, an iron golem charred by dragon fire, the elven armor scraps that the goblins are wearing, uh, the elven wand rifle that one of the goblins has for some reason. So there we go. Use, use flavorful descriptions. Make your dungeon come to life around your players. Uh, 
Ah, so yeah, you can link it to uh, to folklore. Absolutely, TJ. I never uh, fall for using my superpowers against minions like my DMs are trying to get me to do. We'll see, Coffee. One of these days. One of these days. Yeah, <laughs> while I echoing away. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> uh, something to kill you. Dungeons are designed to be beaten. In general, in general they are. Of course, you know, if you want to go old school or with what people call OSR, old school renaissance... Sometimes a dungeon is just an infinite trap that is meant to kill anyone who, who shows up there. Um, you know, oh, something that is that you could do. If any of you want to run Tomb of Annihilation, nothing necessarily stops you from getting to the end game of that adventure and only being level one. There's nothing really that would stop pardon that would stop you from doing it, depending on how creative or clever you are. Or how devious your, your DM is. And yet, if you go into that dungeon, sure, in the meta, we we think, yeah, we're the good guys of the story. We're going to overcome the dungeon. There's going to be stuff in there, etc., etc. And there may very well be. But the dungeon don't care if you're level 1 or level 10 or level 20. It still has the mechanics it's going to have. And you could be beaten by the dungeon. Ah, uh, coffee? I get that. But remember, minions in 4th edition took uh, no... If they saved, even on a half damage effect, uh, they, they didn't die. And minions tended to have slightly higher stats because they were one hit. And so they, they could put up, a, you know, a decent enough fight. Uh, you know, they weren't the boss character for by, uh, by any means. Uh, but some would some would fall to a fireball, and others wouldn't. And there's also occasionally a two-hit minion. Now, especially in fourth ed, when you had the bloodied mechanic, uh, I I to to make a two-hit minion, uh, I enjoyed doing that as well. That way, uh, minions could have some cool bloodied effects, and the player characters had uh, they could use some of their powers that relied on bloody as well against minions. Uh, so, uh, that's why we don't fill them with inescapable obstacles, rocks fall, everyone dies, or impenetrable barriers. Sorry, the whole dungeon is wrapped in, ad in an adamantine dome, you can't get in. Because, of course, ultimately, what would be the point of the story, right? You get your friends to come over, you're sharing Thai food or a pizza, and then, you know, they arrive after the, after the, the trudge through the, the snow or up the mountain, only to find, haha, you can't get in here, fooled you. Well, I hope you all had fun wasting your time. But dungeons need to feel like they were designed to be unbeatable. It's important to feel like this isn't just a bowling alley where the DM sets up the pins for the players to knock down. You need to have deadly elements in your dungeon for it to feel deadly. Just follow these two important rules. Well, try to follow at least one. Label your deadly stuff as such. A sleeping dragon. A door barricaded from the player's side with a sign warning of deadly spiders. These things look deadly from a distance. A chance to escape. Maybe the dragon can't fit into the smaller tunnels around his lair. Maybe the manticore is chained to a rock. Both of those serve the same function. They allow the players to pick their own battles, something you can't do on a linear railroad game. I think that's why a lot of OSR, old school renaissance folks, hate the idea of boss battles, because they're the one battle in the dungeon that is required. Horrible monsters that are avoidable give the players agency and allow them to be architects of their own demise. Side note, I think that nearly all combats should be escapable. Sometimes with a cost, dropped food, gold, maybe a dead PC or hireling. Sounds like a game of Munchkin, if any of you, if any of you have ever played Munchkin. Ooh, that'd be fun to play with you all. Uh, maybe, for a, maybe for a workshop week or something. We could just do things like play... Uh, uh, we could do something like play uh, Munchkin together online. Because I think there's an online version. Anyway, in my experience, PCs will get themselves killed often enough, even if the enemies never left the rooms they were in. 
Also, putting unbeatable monsters in your dungeon also allows the dungeon to be self-scaling. The level 1 party will just tiptoe past the dragon, while the level 6 party might consider fighting it to steal the treasure because it's uh, that it's sleeping on top of. And just like that, a dungeon becomes appropriate for both level 1 parties and level 6 parties. And this is another reason why I think OSR games have such a wide range of level appropriateness. It's both easy and expected that players will flee from fights that they can't win. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, there's been deaths in my Tomb of Annihilation game on Thursdays that uh, could have been avoided uh, from for circumstances like I expected them to flee and they did not. <laughs> Daly says, I like making my uh, parties question their morality early in a campaign. The moment they figure out they were the bad guys, and then they spend the rest of the campaign making up for killing the building full of orphans. Ah. Uh, a little bit of, uh, oh, not retribution, um, uh, recompense, or you're seeking uh, redemption. Redemption, there we go. Now, different paths, and we touched on this also. Uh, that's why we have the different colored arrows to indicate, well, maybe the players can, you know, go through here this way, uh, or, or how do you go through this? Different paths allow different parties to experience the dungeon in different ways. It's a randomizer, similar to what you'd get if you ordered the dungeon rooms according to a random number generator, and it keeps you, the DM, from getting bored. Player agency. Players can choose the path they're better suited for. The party with two clerics can take the zombie-infested tunnel, and the party with air support can get themselves dropped into the courtyard. It also allows dungeons to be a little self-adjusting, too. Players who are more confident can challenge the front door, while lower-level parties will creep around the outside. It allows parties to walk away from rooms they don't like. Part of the OSR philosophy, as I see it, is the ability to walk away from fights. If a party doesn't want to fight a room with archer skeletons entombed in the walls, especially after two of them were blinded in the last room, they can retreat and find another way in. It's an option they have. Uh, so part of this is also then on the dungeon master, whether you go for rule of cool or you're designing something specific you're looking for, that's what it's, it's going towards. The last reason I have multiple paths is to allow for dungeon mastery. I don't mean DMing. I mean that as players learn more about the dungeon, they become better at exploiting its geography. They can lure the carrion crawler over the pit trap that they know is there. They can retreat into a looped path instead of retreating into unexplored rooms. Always a dangerous tactic. At the same time, don't throw in random paths just for the hell of it. The more paths you put in, the less linearity there is to your dungeon. And sometimes you want linearity especially when it comes to teaching your players things or giving clues. Sometimes you want to show the players the eerily clean hallway before they bump into the gelatinous cube. That's a tried and true tactic, by the way. I also did this. Uh, I, I did this tactic on Tuesday um, in the uh, in the uh, the mines, the dwarven mines that were taken over by the Fae. Uh, maybe you want them to meet the zombies with hook hands before they meet the room of crawling animated hands, right? You give the preview. Why are all the zombies outside? Why why do none of them have hands? They'll still do bash attacks, or someone would have just like shoved uh you know like a, a basic like a shiv or a, a sharpened stick through the wrist, and they're like trying to punch and poke that way. Where'd the hands go? Who's using the hands? Oh, you open the next door and suddenly hands, undead crawling hands everywhere. There's nothing wrong with a little linearity if you're putting it there for a reason. boop a doop a doo I'm going to highlight that. I still think that a heavily branched dungeon should be the default assumption, but linear sections of a dungeon are a, are a venal sin, not a mortal one. Now, another thing to include, someone to talk to. People forget this one, and yet it's the one I feel strongest about. Strong enough for caps lock. Every dungeon needs someone to talk to. It's a role-playing game. NPCs are the cheapest and easiest way to add depth to your dungeon. It's easy because everyone knows how to role-play a generic goblin prisoner and has a pretty good idea of what information or services that goblin prisoner can provide. As an example, right? And it's got depth because there are so many ways that the party could use a goblin prisoner. There's almost no bloat. You don't need to invent new mechanics, and it takes almost no space to write there is a goblin in a cage. His name is Zerglum, and he has been imprisoned by his fellows 
uh, for setting rats free. The problem is that lots of dungeons are treasure vaults, tombs, and abandoned mines. The only creatures you usually encounter in those places are undead, golems, oozes, and vermin with ambiguous food chains. None of those are really known for being chatty. So here are some options. A rival adventuring party. Uh, goblins never need explanation. <laughs> I, I like the way that's written. Just goblins, uh, it, replace it, you could say kobolds. So silver pirate, uh, kobolds never need explanation. A spell effect like a chatty magic mouth spell or something. A graveyard nymph. Oh my. Uh, ghosts. Make a sympathetic one. Everyone expects them to be jerks. And you know what? In the in the campaign documents here, when we were coming up with the uh, the settlement here in the prompt. Um, or was it the prompt or was it? Uh, ah, yes. Um. So we, we ended up through our prompts and our imaginations uh, saying that there is a um, there is a ghost that that is a part of the, the trigger mechanism to get the player characters to come to our dungeon. You know, dare you enter our magical realm. And so we actually have a ghost that could play a huge part in the dungeon we created, which goes back and explores how a goddess was called down uh, how a goddess was called down and gifted uh, someone and that gift was torn away and there was this taboo love uh, you know where we had a uh, a drow and a dragonborn <gasps> gasp uh, who fell in love etc and so we can actually have someone who looks gross or disgusting or is an undead and, and at first we're like yes uh, you know uh, turn undead turn undead meanwhile that's you know, even in even in Curse of Strahd, I, I'm not gonna give away any major any major thing. Uh, there, there are, uh, there is or are ghosts or ghosts that are ghosts, and they are a part of Barovia, and Barovia is not a nice place. And yet, if you manage to not destroy them you might learn something interesting. That said, there's also ghosts in Curse of Strahd that you have to destroy because they will destroy you. And so just like with people, you have the good, you have the bad. There's probably even a couple uglies in there too. Uh, oh, I love this recommendation. A ghoul head sitting on a shelf it can talk if you blow through its neck hole, right? It doesn't have lungs to talk, but it can move its mouth and tongue. And so this ghoul might be able to tell you important stuff, but someone has to be brave enough uh, to get the ghoul head you know, and say, all right, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question and I'm going, to, I'm going to blow air through your neck hole and I want you to answer it. And so you have... A and then the ghoul can talk because it's being provided air to go over the vocal cords and the tongue. Uh, there's many places in Curse of Strahd Walleye um, where stuff like that happens. So I may or may not be talking about that. I'm, I'm tiptoeing around it because it's a very good mod and I, I don't want to offer any spoilers about like a specific, you know, is, is something specifically good or bad or, or should you save someone or not save someone? An old man trapped in a painting and communicates by painting. You know, so what would happen here? You, you see someone on the, like in the canvas, but you can only speak in this fashion, like not through words, but through imagery. Uh, on D&D &D time last night, uh, our adventure, we we're going up against a, it was called uh, Dr. Goose, and we went to the Plane of Dreams. And so there kind of a Mother Goose, Dr. Seuss character existed and talked in rhymes. And while we didn't have to, all of us uh, we, we in the party, we really tried talking in rhymes. It was a lot of fun to do. Um, and, uh, and so that's someone you could talk to as well. Um, a demon trapped in a mirror communicates by repeating your own phrases back to you. And of course, a Kenku is like that too. An ancient war machine trapped by a stasis field bomb seeks enemies who died thousands of years ago will self-destruct when it learns that it lost the war. 
Daily, I'm looking at you. Obviously, you know, an infernal war machine was created for war and for a purpose. And what if there's, you know, what if there is that machine spirit to draw on, on Warhammer 40k? You know, what if it, it actually awakens, uh, is re it's activated by, by the player characters and, uh... It takes souls to run. Uh, I always dreamed of being the best ghoul head player in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Consider giving your players speak with stones or speak with lock spells. Dungeons usually have those. And you know what? I don't think it's been made official yet, at least as of this... As of, of when I'm broadcasting live to you. The Eberron expansion for 5th edition, Morgrave Miscellany, has a bard that effectively does this. That that can speak to locks or speak with stones. You know, because there's speak with plants and animals. It, could you think of a... Could you think of a... Uh, a speak with stones that might end up, uh, you know, mimicking the sounds... Uh, or show sort of like a, a discoloration for, you know, the footprints that had traveled over it. Or or, or reproduces the sounds that were made in that hallway uh, sometime in the last 24 hours or something along those lines. You, you know? So s someone you could speak to doesn't have to be a someone. It could be a something as well. A demonic succubus who has spent the last 1,000 years on a bed, trapped by the silver threads woven into a circle on the bed sheet. I'm sure that she would have a tale to tell, and she might be willing to strike a bargain if only you'd let her up. Yeah, uh, that's kind of how that bard works, Walleye. Uh, if, if you haven't seen more Grave Miscellany, we did a review of it. And so you could actually see what I'm talking about with that bard uh, if you search in my YouTube for it. A pterodactyl, uh, pterodactyl riding barbarians who are looting the place. You may think you're the only ones there. Do you know the plans of anyone else in the world? And would you ever expect that pterodactyl riding barbarians would swoop in at this opportunity? Because you're, you're entering at the opportune time as well. That they uh, swoop in and are looting the place. You know, a, a good example of this could be if any of you have played um, some of the more not the arcade side scrolling Alien vs Predator, but some of the, the some of the PC ones, where you are playing, let's say, um, you know, you're playing the Predator and you have to escape a, a research facility or something like that, and you know, you're you're doing that, you might have to put down. Um, you might have to put down the human guards that are trying to keep you trapped there. But what happens when the alien experiments break free? Because you're fighting them too. You, you might not have expected it, but they're there. And that changes your stealth strategy that you've learned in that dungeon, even though it's a, a first-person shooter game. One stolen, two awesome. Uh, what do you mean, while I? Uh, th or the last suggestion: a time displaced wizard, caught in paradox while exploring the the place, resets every three minutes. Ah, so you could demonstrate a mechanic of the dungeon, or you could demonstrate that maybe if you free this person somehow, you could talk to someone, or you only have those three minutes, because he's tired of groundhog daying the same three minutes for the past 10 years in this in this place. But might be, you know, if you're willing to talk, might be willing to help out, especially if, if you can, you know, get to the lab that he knows is there and get the ingredients so he can... Da -da 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 -da. You're going to think about using uh, which, which aspect, Walleye fan. Now, what's another, what's another good thing to include in a dungeon? Something to experiment with. Aside from something that will probably kick the party's butt, I think this might be the most uh, old-school renaissance-ish. 
There are unexplainable. Uh, there are the unexplainable, the weird, and the unknown. I don't mean unknown like the unidentified potion is unknown. I mean something that introduces a new wrinkle into the game. So, a room with two doors of different sizes. Anything that's put into the small door emerges from the large door at twice the size and vice versa. Anything that goes through the doors twice in the same direction, double enlarged or double shrunk, has terrible consequences. A pedestal. If anything is placed on top of it, it turns into its opposite. Okay, the opposite of sword is an axe, but what's the opposite of a banana? A metal skeleton. If a skull is placed atop it, a speak with dead spell is cast on it. Ah, so it's kind of a magic item. It's a metal skeleton, you know, neck down. And if you place a skull, the magic in the rest of the metal bones will allow for the skeleton to speak. Wishing wells that are portals to other small ponds in the dungeon. Where the portal goes is determined by what item you throw in the well before you jump in. Copper coins, silver coins, gold coins, gems, and arrows all lead to different places. And of course, you know, there'd probably be clues or, you know, some research available at some point in time. Or if you want to just let them go in without researching, they're going to learn that quickly that they should have researched before diving into this place. Uh, so, by the way, and on that note, make sure you understand the meta of your playgroup. Because often we might think, well, our dungeon master is presenting a dungeon to us. And as it said above, we're going to beat it. It's going to have a boss. That'll be the end. We're going to beat the dungeon. Yay. That's not always the case. Or it doesn't have to be. Or if, if it is, sure, you go to the dungeon. And if you're expecting to win, good optimism. Did you do any research on that place to possibly learn about, you know, the, the former occupants passwords or cultural relics or even even pick up a side quest oh you're going to the ancient ruins hey while you're there can you pick up um you know there should be a sacrificial chalice uh hidden in the altar um i would pay premium platinum for that could you get that for me and so there's a lot of missed opportunities for knowledge uh or for side quests or reward or a lot of other you know to get uh to get famous uh place a human on it and it turns into a frog uh, Derek says the opposite of a banana is an avocado. Ooh. I'm willing to consider that. Oh, the barbarians on pterodactyls? I, yeah, because walleye, who'd expect that? You, you know, you're you're bringing your players through a dungeon, and, and outside you, you narrate that they hear a flapping and a, rah, a barbaric yop. Yop. And they look outside the, the, you know, one of the, through the, the cracks in the abandoned castle's wall. And they see that uh, 12 barbarians are dismounting uh, from, uh, from pterodactyls, who themselves are probably barbarians for their own race. And suddenly, if the, if the place weren't dangerous enough, you know, maybe you could negotiate with the barbarians. Or maybe the barbarians are like the predators. Or like the Yautja, I believe is what their their real name is. And they're there to hunt. And they're there to, to hunt the big bad evil guy or the big monster that lurks there. And they're also willing to hunt those that are hunting their, their own prey. Because what better way to assert dominance? Um, a boat golem that flees from loud noises. You can direct it by standing at the back of it and shouting. All right? That's that's something to experiment with. Or two holes in the wall. If two limbs are put in the holes, they're swapped. If only one limb is put in the hole, it is severed. Can be used to graft new limbs onto amputees. I totally went in a different direction with pterodactyls riding barbarians. It was more picturing a banjo kazooie. Oh, sure. So, so maybe, yeah, maybe they have. They're using uh, pterodact like pterodactyl glide packs, and so you know when they land, uh, you, the, the pterodactyls can actually you know be battle chickens and and go into combat. Uh, but then uh, they can also be used to fly. That's not a bad idea at all, TJ. Again, who would suspect that? And if any of you do that in your campaign, let me know. I would love to hear that. <laughs> 
Uh, so there's some overlap here with magic items. There's also some overlap with non-magical stuff too. And there's some overlap with combat because some combats can be puzzly uh, or it can rely on new rules or victory conditions. Combat for experienced players is for the most part a solved problem. Weird stuff is important because it gives the players an unsolved problem, right? What does that mean? Well, if I put, you know, a bunch of zombies in a room with you, that's a, that's a problem, but it's a solved problem because you're going to hit them until they stop moving. So that you already know the solution for the most part. Now, you might say, well, how do we get them to stop moving? Well, so there could be some mystery there. But ultimately, you know, boom, monster, the big bad guy, or not the big bad guy, well, ultimately, but, you know, the bad guys in the room have got to go. That's a solved problem. But when you face that unknown, the unknown, like, you warp into a city and there's a tower that's on fire that's never been there before. And getting access to this tower seems to be impossible. No one suspects a flying ball of rage with a giant war chicken. Exactly, walleye fan. And and uh, the heavens help you, hopefully literally, had the heavens help you, if it is actually an abyssal chicken that the barbarians are using to glide into the uh, are using to glide into the ruins. Uh, players know how to best leverage their attacks and abilities. Sure, you can mix it up a bit and force them to think and use different tactics, but by and large, they already know how to use their character to their best effect. They've been practicing it for levels and levels, after all. Uh, it's important to let player uh, players practice the stuff they're good at, i.e. combat with their character, but it's also important to throw some wrenches in there, too. Weird stuff follows its own rules. Suddenly, players don't know anything about how to solve this problem, and they have to figure it out anew. Bonus points if it's something that could potentially unbalance your game. Nothing gives a player more agency than the ability to completely derail your setting. Not that you need to go that far. More bonus points if it's something that will probably hurt the players at first, but can be used to their advantage once they've figured out how it works. One last perk, it gives level 1 characters a chance to be as useful as level 10 characters. Anyone can stick an arm into the hole in the wall, and anyone can figure out what it does. Weird stuff often poses threats and rewards that are level agnostic. And if you've never if you've never heard this term or a concept like it before, things that are level agnostic, class agnostic, magic agnostic, it's it is a, a consideration, and especially for a storyteller, uh, when you're getting maybe away from the pure storytelling and you're looking for more mechanical things, it is something to keep in mind. Um, you know, could wizards and barbarians alike get through this situation? And if not, that's fine. But uh, perhaps are there clues that could be discovered if not put into the into the PC's laps? that would indicate as such so that they can find another solution like getting a hireling or making a friend or uh, it's an evil party they kidnap someone and force them to put their to put their arm into the hole or whatever and lastly and i love this touch something the players probably won't find this one might be a bit contentious why put stuff in your dungeon that your players won't find First, you don't have to put much in the dungeon, just a few words here or there to reward the players who are more thorough. Inside the purple worm stomach is a bag of holding full of 1,000 gallons of purple worm stomach acid. Or, the pirate captain has a gold bar hidden in his peg leg, wrapped in felt so that it won't rattle. It's not like you're designing multiple cool rooms that no one will ever get to enjoy. But I mean, I do that sometimes, says the narrator here. I think it's important to hide things because there's a sincere joy in exploration and testing the limits. If all of the things in a dungeon are obvious, why even bother wondering uh, what is at the bottom of the well? Is there anything interesting buried beneath all this mud? Players who don't have the time or resources to explore a dungeon 100%, and they shouldn't, will always walk away with a feeling of enormity that there was always more to find. Sure, completion is a nice feeling, but so is wonderment. I like to reward people who are good at the game, and being good at finding things, thinking about where they might be, exploring those places despite the risk it involves, is one of the ways that a player can be good at D&D. And not just D&D, I mean, it's said so here. These dungeon concepts can apply to uh, a conflict of sorts in Vampire the Masquerade. 
and if not at the tabletop, and I, I've run dungeons, so to speak, as a as a tabletop vampire character. Um, but look at Bloodlines. Bloodlines uh, features several things that you definitely could call a dungeon. Um, and and yet these concepts are here, especially finding things that are out of the way that might be hidden. Um, you know, the the haunted house is a good example. Um, uh, and in a lot of the other concepts above. Um, so it's not just D&D. &D. You could use this in Shadowrun. You could use this in Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Uh, all flesh must be eaten. Uh, the, you know, Dread. You could use this in Dread. We were just talking about that earlier. So um, it should be a spectrum. Some things, most things, should be out in the open. Some stuff should be hidden behind curtains. And some stuff should be tucked deeply away in the dungeon's folds. So yeah, the next time you decorate a room with a mural of a defeated king presenting tribute to his conqueror, be sure to put an actual treasure chest in the wall behind the painting of a treasure chest. I've run that dungeon three times, and no one has ever found it. I get a little excited every time I describe it to players. There's also undead skeletons entombed in the wall behind the paintings of skeletons. No one's ever found them either. But someday, some party with the right alloy of greed, cleverness, and patience will find them and that will be great and good morning to you old port media i guess it is it's 118 right so that is that is the dungeon checklist and before we go on break because we'll do that in a little bit i'm not going to go over all of them if you haven't heard of grimtooth's traps I would recommend looking into it because you are going to be in for a delight with a supplement like this. And it doesn't just have to be Grimtooths because there are some very devious and clever traps to be had here. And the illustrations for them are, are nice and concise. And, uh, yeah, here's a lobster trap. Um, so, yeah, we're going to, like, I might reference this when we're going into the dungeon, you know, for, like, one, like a cool big trap kind of a thing, uh, which itself may just be one of the rooms, is trying to figure this out without dying or, or the like. Um, but we're, we're not going, uh, this isn't a supplement review. I'm not going to be... Um, I'm not going to be going through uh, the whole thing, but there's a lot of fun and devious stuff here that you can that you can see. The shoot and hammer trap, um, uh, murderers, uh, rolling stones. Oh yeah, this one as well. Uh, a stair snare. So your foot goes down, and the and the spikes are pointed downwards. So what happens is your leg is caught. And the spikes are just barely penetrating your skin or your bone. And now what happens if you try and wrench your leg up on the spikes? Dun, dun, dun. I also love sticking lore into them and forcing the players to hurt themselves multiple times to either figure them out or disarm them to get information, says Old Port. I had a fighter be really smart about that. Everyone sticks uh, their weapons down. Uh. And oh, so is that uh, is that uh, what the enemies abound? Do you put that spell as a trap? On uh, and so that that itself. I mean, that spell as you're talking about, old port. The enemies abound spell out of Xanathar's could very much just be a trap, a magical trap itself. All right, so I'm gonna get up and take a little break, and when we come back, we uh, let's. I have I have the elements of what we talked about here, and so let's see if we can fill that out with the basic concept of the dungeon. That of course is the culmination of all of our other notes, which we can reference if we need to. But I don't want to get us to go. Blah, 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 what's going on? Uh, and all googly eyed about it. So I will be back in a little bit. Everyone, hang in there. <laughs> 